can come up with a pretty fair number of books that relate to what we are dealing with one way or another. <coughs> and these books he is about to deposit in the reserve reading room. Uh, I'll give you uh, the list in just a moment, and I hope the others of you who have books that might be useful to us will do the same and give us a list as well. Uh, a note of caution, quite a few of these books are in very delicate condition and obviously can't be replaced. So if you uh, take them for your own use, please be extremely careful with them. In some cases, the bindings are almost ripped off and whatnot. So you'll, this obviously dictates a special amount of care. Very quickly, what Sean has come up with so far uh, includes some books that are on our list. It just means we now will have extra copies. Ortega y Gasset's Revolt of the Masses, Marcuse's One Dimensional Man, Cleaver's Soul on Ice, Dos Passos USA, Dos Passos State of the Nation, which comes after the 30s period, Dalton Trumbull's Johnny Got His Gun, Claude Brown's Man Child in the Promised Land, Henry Ross Call It Sleep, Travin's The Treasure of Sierra Madre, and also The Rebellion of the Hang. Albert Maltz's The Way Things Are, coming directly out of the 30s, not on our list. It's short stories, isn't it? Richard Wright's Uncle Tom's Children, Jack Hardy's First American Revolution, a Marxist text about the revolutionary tradition in the United States, published in the 1930s, and therefore a good statement of the ideology of the communist movement of that time. Chester Himes, If He Hollers, Let Him Go, post-1940. Um, Ignacio Silone's The Seed Beneath the... St no, it's Snow, isn't it? Not, it's not the stone. Seed beneath the snow, I think. Uh, a most significant revolutionary novel coming out of a revolutionary leader and fine writer in Italy, written during the period of fascism when he was in exile. John, well, now I'll skip the titles that I've taken myself for quick browsing. I'll give them to you when I put them in the reserve room. Uh, Ronsky's, Bronowski's, Brother of Bill McKee. Now, which one is that? I don't remember. It's about a, a labor leader of some kind? Yeah. Uh, Boyer and Morias, Labor's Untold Story, a history of uh, labor organization in this country, in our, in our century. Bill Haywood's book, Bill Haywood's autobiography, he being the very charismatic leader of the IWW or Wobblies, International Workers of the World, in the period before the First World War out of which many people came who organized the Communist Party. Uh, is it Harry or Henry Slockauer? Harry, I think. Is it Henry? Whatever. Slockauer. No Voice is Wholly Lost, a uh, basic uh, discussion out of the 1930s of Marxist uh, principles of literary criticism. Henry, what? Krabs? Crass? Crass. The Many and the Few. I don't remember what that one is. Organizing labor unions organizing at the port factory, right. Um, okay. Please uh, don't delay in getting the others of you who have books we can use and getting them into the reserve room and letting us know what you deposited there. Uh, and a quick announcement, you might be interested in this. Lewis S. B. Leakey is speaking here Monday, November 3rd. 3 p.m., Royce Hall Auditorium, on East African origins of proto-man, near-man, and man himself. I'm, I'm sure you all know about Leakey, whose uh, revolutionary anthropological work in Africa has led to the books Unveiling Man's Origins, Adam's Ancestors, and White Africa. We left off with Crunchdot last time. I'd like to take a brief holiday from Crunchdot and talk about Anaheim. Uh, I'll uh, take a vote at the end of this. A significant event has happened in Anaheim. I assume you all know that Anaheim is a, an American community <laughs> in uh, rock-bound, rock-ribbed, uh, Republican Orange County where there is a substantial representation of the John Birch Society. I think some cultural background is needed for what I'm about to tell you. There is an ideology in Anaheim. It is an ideology of cleanliness. Uh, their concept of existence is based upon two institutions. The baseball team, which is centered there. Which, which one is it? The, the Angels. The Angels. 
a thoroughly clean American institution, <laughs> and uh, Disneyland. <laughs> and it's, I think we can assume that the reason both of these institutions are located in Anaheim is that they're entirely sexless. <laughs> it's obvious that uh, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse uh, dance a lot and tell jokes a lot, but nothing beyond that. And that's very satisfying to the community of Anaheim. Now, something has happened in Anaheim the last few days of, of import. Uh, a bold superintendent of schools who uh, somehow got displaced to Anaheim <laughs> with very un-Anaheim ideas instituted a system of sex education in the public school system, whereupon all the right-wing Republicans and John Birch Society people uh, raised such a howl that he had to leave his job. Uh, some of the people who led this campaign to get rid of this monstrous revolutionary uh, were interviewed on television recently, and one of them, in particular, said something very germane to our concern. In a most agitated way, he said, teaching matters of sex in a public school system is humanist. Humanism has no place in education. Well, you see, we're right back at crunch time. I tried at the beginning to say to you that the central concept of communism and its origins was that of a humanistic program for a new humanistic society. The communism of Marx and Engels came out of the very pinnacle of humanist thought in the 19th century. Today, humanism seems like a very mild term. It's related to a sort of prissy liter school of literary criticism that existed in this country in the 20s, very academic, very ingrown. And it's related to vague liberal principles. But I think if it's examined profoundly in the way that Marx and Engels examined it, it becomes a revolutionary idea, and it's perfectly clear that in Anaheim they recognize the revolutionary quality of humanism properly considered. Humanism, to give you a most haphazard and much too superficial definition, rests upon the idea that the individual is sacred, that the individual comes before any group, any organization, any authority, that all the capacities of the individual should be given maximum opportunity to develop, and that essentially the attitude of society toward the individual to the extent that it is humanly possible should be hands off, go your own way. That is revolutionary. It is so revolutionary that it has not yet been enacted into a society in our time. But it is essential to keep in mind that this is what Marx and Engels had in mind, and it is what very few of their descendants, their ideological descendants in our century, have in mind. Indeed, at the center of most official communist ideology of our century, is the idea that humanist individualism is an outdated, degenerate, bourgeois concept, that it has is only of historical interest, that it arose at the time that capitalist society was bursting out of the bonds, bonds of feudalism and had to establish the principle of individual enterprise, the sacred quality of individual endeavor, and that now, when that period in history is passed and a new communal order must be brought into existence, the individual, the priority of the individual, becomes a reactionary concept. And group concerns must take precedence. I would say that the problem of how you define humanism and how you rate it is at the center of practically all of the revolutionary stir in the world today.
that the fierce and vicious repressions taking place in Czechoslovakia in the past year or so revolve directly around this issue, that the efforts of those very courageous um, mavericks of the communist world who tried to introduce a new quality to communist thinking in their own country, a humanist quality, and who summed it up in a very simple phrase that has become anathema to the Soviet bureaucracy, the phrase communism with a human face. These people were revolutionaries within the allegedly revolutionary world, as were the Hungarians, times recently passed. This issue is not only of burning importance at the very center of our concerns today, but haunts the history that we've been talking about. What indeed was the significance of the event called Kronstadt? It was the triumph of organization, order, authority over the humanist tradition in communism. It said in essence, the individual is nothing, the collectivity is everything. And said this in violation of the basic original premises of Marxism. Almost every issue that becomes a bone of contention and leads to schisms in the communist world, socialist or communist world, has at its center a concept of humanism, whether for it or against it. Here we discussed the split in the Socialist Party of Russia in 1903, apparently over a simple matter of organization, the question of democratic centralism. It emerged in short order that there was the most profound political difference between the two camps, and that the political difference had to do with the matter of humanism. And the final proof that this is the case is in Kronstadt, because in Kronstadt we see that the democratic part of the formula, democratic centralism, was lost completely, and in the democratic part of it was, were the last vestiges of humanism, because democracy in its true sense, not in its crippled sense as we see it in our own capitalist society, in its true sense, corresponds to the basic needs uh, of the individual, to rights of the individual, that in Kronstadt, democracy in Lenin's formula went entirely by the board and centralism became the order of the day. Doubly important because it remained the order of the day from that time to this, in that bastion of the communist, allegedly communist world. Trotsky was in a very particular position in Kronstadt because although his politics had been far to the left of all the Bolsheviks up through 1917, and although in the summer of 1917 he was the only one who insisted that the bourgeois revolution be carried over directly and immediately into a socialist proletarian revolution, although he was at the farthest left politically, he was the strongest uh, adherent to the humanist content of communist theory in his opposition to Lenin's democratic centralism because he understood indeed that the democracy in the formula was largely a window dressing and that the result would be a totalitarian order if power were ever achieved. And yet, because of the foul realities of politics, when he returned to Russia in 1917, he understood that only the Bolsheviks had a bold enough program and that if one wanted to participate in history making in Russia, one had to be with the Bolsheviks. And so he swallowed all of his concern about Bolshevik Leninism and its organizational principles a concern which he had so eloquently laid out in 1903 and 4 in his book, Our Political Tasks, which remained, remains to this day 
the strongest attack upon Bolshevik Leninism that I know of in print. He swallowed all of this and joined the Bolsheviks. Then came crunch start and he finally had to pay his dues. If you recall, his immediate reaction to the alleged mutiny in, crunch, in the crunch start garrison was, these are our brothers, these are the, were the most heroic fighters in the revolution, these are our closest friends, we must sit down and talk with them. In a dialogue we will resolve the problems. And then all the old Bolsheviks who had been with Lenin since 1903 and who looked with grave suspicion upon Trotsky as a, an international uh, cosmopolitan intellectual and much too freewheeling in his thinking, all of them said, you see, we are the hard guys. Hardness is what a revolution needs. He now emerges in his true softness. He only pretended to be hard during the three years he led the, the uh, Red Army in the Civil War. But now his essential wishy-washiness emerges, and it is, in essence, counter-revolutionary. Trotsky immediately turned about and agreed with the old Bolsheviks that there must be no dealing with the Kronstadt sailors, but that their demands must be ignored and an ultimatum must be issued and if they did not an ultimatum demanding unconditional surrender and if they did not surrender they must be annihilated and they were and by Trotsky's own red army but Trotsky could not rest easy about this event he was a very articulate man I would say perhaps the strongest literary genius ever to emerge from politics of any sort I think of an order that makes Winston Churchill look like a, look like a bumbling schoolboy. This man had to justify what had happened in Kronstadt, and he tried to. He wrote voluminously about it. He came up with a most astonishing phrase to justify what had happened. He said the Kronstadt of 1917 was no longer the Kronstadt of 1921. In 1917 and throughout the Civil War, indeed, the main body of the sailors' garrison there had been made up of revolutionary workers, industrial workers, real proletarians. But that in the period after the Civil War ended, uh, these forces had been diluted. More and more of the staunchest proletarians had been sent out to fight in other fronts, remote from Kronstadt. And in their place had come <coughs> backward elements of the peasantry, young peasants who in essence have to be petty bourgeois because they have an attachment, however meager, to the land, so they are private property owners, or their families are, and no matter how hard they have to work, the tiny plot of land they have, they still think in terms of private property. And so he was arguing that the social composition of the garrison had changed. It was no longer uh, the spearhead of the revolution. And he, and he came up with this phrase to indicate the quality of the mass of people there after this alleged alteration in, in social composition. He said, what remained at Kronstadt was a dull gray mass. He had to pay heavily for this statement, this attitude of contempt for people who do not come directly out of the big city, the real urbanized, uh, big industry proletariat. This kind of scorn for even the lowliest who happen to come from the countryside rather than the city, more and more became a, a, a built-in quality of Bolshevik doctrine. Trotsky, I'm sure, never fully believed it, but he resorted to that language in a much too sweaty effort to justify the massacre at Kronstadt. He was not to be left all of his life unchallenged about this. I can't give you all the details, it would take far too long, but I believe, and I've tried to argue this in the book I've written about his last days, I believe that he was haunted by Kronstadt from the moment it took place. I'll give you one bit of um, evidence to that effect. Shortly after Kronstadt, he developed a series of physical symptoms of fever, uh, gastric upset, and whatnot, a general nervous condition, which required uh, investigation by experts, such as were not to be found in Russia at that time. He went to Germany to see uh, medical experts there. 
They made elaborate studies of him. The diagnosis was, in French, fièvre uh, d'origine cryptogène. Fever of cryptogenic origin. Cryptogenic meaning simply mysterious. In other words, an early term for uh, psychosomatic. Now, I think that that fever was induced by uh, the aftermath of Kronstadt and by the agony he experienced about it, about his inability to, to stand by his original position. tried to explain it partly as the reason that after Lenin died, he, he didn't do much in, in Yeah, we're, we're going to come to that, absolutely, sure, sure. Uh, but what I want to suggest now, and very summarily, is that at the end of his life in Mexico, uh, in the late 30s, he was obliged to deal with a series of people who were truly courageous liberals and uh, leftist people, but not in any sense uh, Trotskyites people largely out of universities in this country, who had been deeply disturbed by the series of trials in Russia called the Moscow trials and the attendant mass purges, uh, upset first of all because these trials consisted getting a series of old Bolsheviks, finally the cream of the old Bolshevik leadership generation, to get up and confess, confess to the most uh, impossible crimes of sabotage and mass murder and poisoning and uh, conspiracy to uh, destroy the Soviet system and turn Russia over to Hitler. All of this under the guidance of the archdemon Trotsky from in exile. And since Trotsky was named as the arch-conspirator by all the people who confessed, people in the Western world were upset simply because Trotsky was not there physically on trial to defend himself. This violates elementary principles of Western jurisprudence, that a man cannot be tried in his absence, in absentia. And so a lot of people got together and formed a commission of inquiry into the Moscow trials, headed by perhaps the uh, outstanding philosopher ever produced in this country, John Dewey, who was then professor emeritus at Columbia University, and many other people from universities around the country gathered into this. It became known as the John Dewey Commission of Inquiry into the Moscow Trials. And they uh, conducted uh, uh, commission hearings and subcommission hearings. They sent a commission to Mexico and spent weeks examining and cross-examining Trotsky and getting whatever documents he had related to the Moscow Trials. They sent other commissions to Europe. They amassed an enormous amount of evidence and finally published two volumes. They were published by Harper and Brothers. Um, one of them consisting of all their documents and resulting from the investigation, the other consisting of their conclusions, and their conclusions were to the effect that all the Moscow trials were frame-ups, and therefore the, the basis for all of the mass purges uh, was absolutely false. Now, I think Trotsky entered the most critical period of his life at just this moment. Here were a bunch of courageous um, individuals, uh, ranging from liberal to left, with no political affiliations, who had helped to vindicate him and had helped to expose the Moscow trials for what they were and therefore by inference to, to indicate the incredibly reactionary role of Stalinism in the revolutionary world. But these people were not content to rest with uh, the publication of these two volumes. They were gravely concerned about how this could have happened in Russia, a revolutionary state, a worker state. How could these incredible juris, uh, the juridical frame-ups take place and the uh, mass purges take place in a revolutionary country? Well, Trotsky's answer, which he put forth in a series of books before that and after, was that this revolution had deteriorated, had decayed for a whole series of reasons, had indeed been betrayed, but still was essentially some kind of distorted, deformed worker state. And so these people began now to ask him questions in print. And it was first and foremost John Dewey himself who carried enormous weight in the entire intellectual community of the world. He began to ask in print, when did this degeneration begin to take place? And Trotsky began to try to give dates. He started with 1934 when the Kirov assassination took place. That was the signal to unleash the purges and then the trials. 
They weren't satisfied with that. He went back to 1930-31, when the forced collectivization of the peasants took place and millions were simply starved to death. They weren't satisfied with that. He went back to 1927-29, when the Communist Party of Russia was made entirely monolithic through driving out first the left opposition, which was the Trotskyite opposition, and then the right opposition. They weren't satisfied with that, and they came back with a very simple question. Have you failed to go back far enough? Did this degeneration of this ideal worker state indeed not begin in 1921 in Kronstadt? Trotsky tried to answer these uh, very probing articles in articles of his own. And for the first time in his career, his uh, eloquence faltered. His literary style became ill-mannered, harsh, impatient. He simply couldn't answer. And I believe this, by the, all of this, by the way, was taking place in 1938 and 39. And I believe that his agitation over this matter, Kunstak come back to haunt him, led him to make it possible for Stalinist agents to assassinate him. He need not have been assassinated. Elementary safeguards could have been established the assassin could not have come near him. He was in unconscious collaboration with his assassin, I believe. And I think I've tried to indicate the psychology behind that. And I think you can see that the issue all the way through to Trotsky, to the end of Trotsky's life, was that of the possible place of humanism, the original spirit of communism, in the communist structures of the 20th century, and whether indeed a communist society can be built without a central humanistic spirit. Well, a quick indication of the situation immediately following, at the time of Kronstadt and immediately following it, around the world. The socialist parties, those that had remained in the Second International, had been rendered and split all over the place because those people to the left in the socialist parties despised what their parties had done by supporting their various governments in the war. Now, with the Russian Revolution and with the Communist Party of Russia established as a truly powerful force, many of the dis discontented people who had dropped out or were dropping out of the left wing of the, of the socialist parties around the world began to form communist parties. These communist parties came together and formed a th third, uh, or communist, international, uh, whose strong direction was always gotten from uh, Moscow. Now we have to go through the events of the 20s very, very rapidly. Next crucial event was Lenin's uh, serious uh, wounding by uh, a social revolutionary woman, uh, his long period of illness, and his death. When he died, he left a document called his last will and testament, in which he warned the party, Communist Party of Russia, that they faced a crisis, that very dangerous tendencies had begun to arise in the party, toward bureaucracy, toward uh, mindless uh, uh, issuing of orders. He was truly really warning that the centralism of his early formula was becoming runaway and the democracy part of it was indeed being abandoned all over the place. He got specific about this. He said, mentioning names, Stalin, in particular, is rude and disloyal and must be dismissed. Trotsky, uh, though he has a tendency to bury himself in administrative work, and this indeed he had, I think, in his revulsion against uh, Kronstadt, though he has this tendency, there has been no better Bolshevik since he joined us in 1917. And what he was implying was that Trot Stalin, who was rising rapidly, through inner party conspiracies and forming of blocks. Stalin should be removed and Trotsky should be Lenin's successor. 
this will was suppressed for some years. Max Eastman, somewhere in 1927, was traveling in Russia and came upon a copy. He got it from Trotsky. He published it, and that became known to the world for the first time. Dealing with, again, a very complicated political problem, political and psychological. Uh, in an apparently very simplistic discussion of the difference between personalities, between uh, Stalin and Trotsky. I think at this point, everybody who was at all thoughtful in Russia understood that there was a crisis in, in uh, personnel for the building of a new order after power was won. It began to be obvious that to be much too categorical about it. There are really two very different basic types of people who get involved in revolutionary movements. And they get involved in different ways. There are those who are the flaming firebrands who realize themselves most fully in the heat of battle, who have natural leadership abilities. As Trotsky did fantastically, a man who had never uh, held a gun in his life, suddenly leading a Red Army, and doing it brilliantly. After studying one book on uh, military strategy by Clausewitz, which told him little more than that uh, uh, war is a continuation of politics by other means, that famous phrase. <laughs> I think he knew that without the, uh, the scholarship. Uh, there is that type of man, and he usually is in the forefront of the action, and he fights heroically and develops enormous charisma, and people fall in line behind him and follow him. And when the fighting falters in the front lines, he uh, exhibits uh, uh, fantastic acts of bravery and, 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 and builds morale again. The Kronstadt sailors were of that order. That's why Trotsky loved them so much and why they loved him. Uh, when the fighting was going badly on a particular front, the Kronstadt sailors could always be relied upon to come in and uh, get people to fight again, simply by fighting so heroically themselves. But there's another kind of man who participates in a revolution. He's of a less flamboyant order. Uh, he may participate in the fighting. If he does, he, he does his very best to stay as far away from bullets as possible. Uh, and is usually pretty successful at it. Uh, he supports the revolution, and maybe very sincerely, maybe he's ideologically committed to it. But his fundamental personal interest is, is to stay alive and operate in the new social and political structure once it's arrived at. I think you can see what I'm trying to suggest. There are people who are primarily fighters and who take perhaps an extra political joy in the wreckage that's associated with revolutionary fighting. There are others who are primarily builders, uh, born bureaucrats, uh, born guiders of social structures. I think it has to be said that Trotsky was of the first order, and Stalin and many of his associates of the second order. This again is a problem that's not unrelated to our own times. We see the problem post, posed in a burning fashion in, in Cuba. Uh, it's kind of a parody of the psychological complexities of post-1920 uh, Russia. Here you have a Che Guevara who exhibits remarkable leadership qualities the moment he joins the Castro guerrilla forces in the Sierra Maestra mountains, um, uh, to whom people flock, uh, recognizing a brilliance and recognizing a very special kind of heroism. But of course, Castro had this too. And look at the extraordinary extraordinarily different directions in which they went after the revolution. Castro remains very much the leader of that government, very much in control of things, uh, although he's perhaps a little bit bored with the dull, drab, day-to-day -day business of building out of nothing. He stays with it. He knows how to work with people who are uh, committed to building and have real talent for it. Guevara couldn't stand the power once it had been achieved. He flourished. He realized himself totally in the fighting. 
he began to chafe at the bit once he was made a minister in a new government. He was a minister of, uh, of uh, industry. And one has to say that under him, industry, which was a shambles to begin with, became a double shambles. <laughs> he had no concept of working with figures, of systematic planning, of organizing technicians. He couldn't stand to sit in an office. One, along the way, has to ask the question, which I think is not only legitimate, but at the very center of the psychological problems of revolution. Is the man who is not prepared to take on the duties and responsibilities of a post-revolutionary situation, is that man justified in undertaking to fight in the revolution? Well, however you answer that question, Guevara came up against a, a dilemma insoluble to him. And um, I'm going to bring in a book about him which contains a series of letters between him and his mother. But the exchange is really remarkable. His mother, an elderly, elderly member of the uh, Argentinian aristocracy, considerable money in the family, living in uh, an elite suburb of Buenos Aires, writing to her son, Che, the Minister of Industry of Cuba, criticizing him, from what point of view do you suppose? From the point of view of a revolutionary socialist who believes that her son is not being faithful to the revolution. Extraordinary situation. In any case, what she points her finger at, his essential dilemma added up to this. The idealist, the flaming idealist in this revolution, as in others, including the Russians, had one idea in mind, to create not only a whole new social order, but a new man. The slogan has now become a commonplace, the new communist man. This is what inspired Che Guevara in all of his uh, revolutionary fighting. He wanted to see a totally new human structure within the, so the totally new social structure. And indeed, he thought that the new social structure would be impossible unless mankind itself were transformed, the basic human material. Transformed in what sense? That all material concern would be eliminated from man's consciousness. They would be truly devoted to the collectivity. So devoted and so indifferent to material things that money could be abolished. This remains an aim of the Cuban Revolution. I hesitate to uh, predict when it will come about but this remains a stated aim of the revolution. Castro, however, recognizes, being a realist, that that may be a lovely prospect sometime in the future, if it is possible, but that you have to deal with what exists today. And so he's not abolished money, he keeps wage differentials, and so on. Uh, Guevara came upon this problem immediately as he tried to run, begin to run the Ministry of Industry, because you had to begin to build industry, practically from scratch, which meant you had to get people to work devotedly in factories. How do you inspire people to work hard? It turns out that it's not enough to overturn an old society and put in a new one and say to the people, now this is your society. You own it. You control it. This is not our government. We only represent you. And since you control it, you ought to work hard for it. But somehow people don't respond. They learned that early on in Russia. So after an initial period of absolute egalitarianism in wage payments, they quickly established wage differentials, uh, bonuses for extra production, what came to be known as a Stakhanovite system. Stakhanov was a worker who produced, I don't know, 17 times what anybody else did in this factory, and they began to pay him accordingly. So he became a rich man. Uh, the whole idea of wage incentives struck Guevara as an abomination, an obscenity to a revolutionary. But there were practical-minded people within the ministry, technicians, um, new managerial bureaucrats, who said, do you want to go on talking about an abstract image of what the human animal should be but isn't, or do you want to build industry and get some factories running? 
We now have the example of Russia. We have the ex example more recently of China. If you want production, you've got to give people a material incentive. Gavana couldn't stand this thought. And I think it led him finally. That plus the whole pressure of the bureaucratic life led him finally to undertake a mission which he understood completely, I think, was suicidal. In political terms, the mission in Bolivia made no sense whatsoever, had no impact whatsoever on the situation there. Uh, there were no important groups of people ever attracted to that band of guerrillas. They remained in complete isolation, absolutely distrusted by the Indians in that area, uh, informed upon by the Indians, uh, with no co viable connection with the Communist Party in the cities, and with grave um, ideological differences with the official Communist parties in the cities. And all this was certainly known in advance. In his diary, obviously, he doesn't tell us that he knew all this in advance. But to his closest friend, Regis de Bray, who, as you know, is now in jail, having been an associate of his in Bolivia, he, he explained, expressed more than once his impulse to go out on some flaming mission, to die somewhere in a revolutionary gesture. We'll have to ask, finally, if dying can ever be a revolutionary gesture, or if indeed the tendency, the urge on a part of so many revolutionaries to extinguish themselves in an ultra-dramatic way does not suggest that in many revolutionary mentalities there is a masochism so severe as to make it questionable that they really want what they say they want in terms of a really viable and humanistic new social order. <coughs> Great many of the type of revolutionaries you're talking about come from middle classes like Che and so on. Sure. But there, I Upper think, classes. Yeah, okay. I think there's a certain sort of desperation on the part of people who, you know, ultimately throw themselves against the system, the proletariat or whatever, the revolutionary masses, which says, you know, it's it's so desperate, you know, that it really doesn't matter, you know, whether, you know, it's, yeah, it's but I think kind of I think now one of the challenges to us who are concerned with such processes is to consider what the source of that desperation is. I think we have to we have to probe that more profoundly. And it may not be related entirely. Exactly, exactly, or to politics. So that I, what I'm trying to emphasize is there are the gravest personnel problems. And I, I don't propose to give you any solutions. I don't know them, but I think the problems ought to be stated finally. Could it be also, you know, the difference between Gastro and Chet, Chet, that Chet has more of the, the historical identification with, say, Martin Bolivar. That was, I think so, yeah. Yeah. You know, that he belonged to the entire country. Yeah. And, you know, that Cuba wasn't his home. It could never be. And he could never be totally accepted by the people. Yeah. The workers. Well, his, I'll, I'll, I'm going to bring this in next time. In, in this crucial letter he, his mother wrote him, uh, she said, uh, there's an interesting question about you. Will you ever be accepted anywhere? Aren't you destined to play the role of the outsider? I'll bring it in. It's a very important document. Well, I think we've had it for today. <coughs>